Good morning. Uh, again, welcome uh, to St. Peter's. We're going to continue uh, our study in this book, as it is in heaven. And even though the first chapter is what we've been covering for two months, it wasn't designated as the first chapter. I called it the introduction. Today is technically the first chapter. So before we get into that, just a, a very brief, very brief review. And let's read a couple of scripture references just to kind of orient our thinking. JP, can you read Isaiah 5.13? <coughs> Isaiah 513. Isaiah. Okay, yeah. I mumbled this time a bit. <laughs> Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and the honorable men are famished, and their multitude drive the thirst. Sue? Hosea 4 6. Oh, I, thought, I thought you said Isaiah. Hosea 4 6. you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. So, if you'll remember when I first, be, when we first started, you know, all those weeks ago, one of the things that I, I said was that what we are trying to do is present what God is teaching us through his word. This is the focus of what we're doing. This isn't a matter of trying to pile on information and make you guys erudite scholars, uh, which we can do if we want, but that's not what we're doing here. What we want is for you to grasp what God is saying specifically about this subject, and that is how he, how he is to be worshipped, okay? And part of that is our discussion of this, because as I mentioned earlier, we come to all of this, whether it's this particular model here of the kingdom of heaven, uh, intruding into the kingdom of earth, creating the kingdom of earth and God's, God's kingdom on earth, whether it's that or whether it's scripture, we come to this with a very American, Anglo-American framework. And part of what we have to do is strip, strip that away. That has to go. This is, an, this is a Near Eastern book written with Near Eastern concepts, and these are what we have to understand if we are to truly understand what these concepts mean and what they mean to us. Now, that doesn't mean that we go out and sacrifice sheep or stone homosexuals or anything like that. What it means is that we have to understand why these things took place what these concepts meant in scripture and then how we apply those concepts today. But we really have to move away from an American way of thinking. And when it comes to American intuition, American ideology, worship jumps right to the front. We as Americans have this concept of worship that is, in most cases today, 180 degrees in the opposite direction of what God has commanded. Not suggested, but what he has commanded. That's what essentially the book is about. That's why I included this. This is the framework that's going to structure everything we talk about through the rest of the book. Because this is what's taking place. Okay, the kingdom of heaven and all that is transpiring in the kingdom of heaven, and that's what we're going to talk about today, what this model of worship is, and how this, via the Holy Spirit, 
becomes the kingdom on earth. Okay. Now, to start off, I want to give you a sense as to what this means when we talk about the heavens and the earth. Roz, can you read Nehemiah 9, 5 and following? Yes. Without the... Without, all, without the all the Jewish names. Thank you. <laughs> then the Levites said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God, who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. Okay. Did you catch that? Because I'm going to refer to a couple of specific elements in that that bear on what we're going to be talking about. And now let's cross-reference that passage with Psalm 103, beginning at verse 19. It's just a couple of verses to the end of the chapter. Psalm 103, 19. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. I'm reading from the New King James, by the way. Bless the Lord, you, he, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, Oh, my soul. Who had Psalm 148? Diane, 148, 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the height. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. And... Who had one, Colossians 1.16? Me. Teresa. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, for the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Now you notice in the discussion of the creation narratives, something is included that come that that becomes very important in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. Roz mentioned it when she read Nehemiah. We, heard, we just heard Teresa in Colossians 1, and it's alluded to in the other references. And that is the visible heavens. As we're talking about God's creative acts, in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, the visible heavens emerge as earth. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven and God's creative act, creating the heaven of the heavens, creating the seas, well, there were no seas in heaven, right? No. But immediately Nehemiah, via the Holy Spirit, talks about Abraham. There is a union of the two. One is derivative of the other. So via the Holy Spirit, this winds up becoming here. And this is going to become the seedbed of everything that we talk about moving forward. This will be the context. And we've spoken about God's sovereignty and that all of this belongs to God. That's going to be the driving text, if you will, even though it's more than one text. But that's going to be the driving core of what we're looking at right here. All of this is God's. There is this connection between the two. He owns it, and because he owns it, he is going to command us to interact with him in a very specific way. We'll get to that in later chapters, but keep that in mind, okay? We, as we look at this, we see that part of what makes this critical for our attention is to understand where sin, holiness, and how God's holiness 
plays in this, right? Sin is what we've identified, the rebellion and all of those terms that we use, that scripture uses to define sin. We've then talked about what holiness is, and we combined those two to uh, create this juxtaposition between what happens with a holy God when sin enters into the picture, right? Okay? So we have to start at this point to reorient our thinking. We have to become now true Israelites and start thinking about God the way an Israelite would think about God with the caveat that we do it through the lens of Christ. All right? Not through our American understanding of language or concepts, but through Christ. And what we're going to talk about today, and believe it or not, I'm actually going right to the book right now. What we're going to talk about today, right now, is the following. We're going to talk about the heavenly model that is to be replicated on earth. And we're going to be talking about this, the, we're talking about Isaiah 6 and the apocalypse of uh, Jesus' revelation to John. We're going to talk about the spiritual characteristics of this heavenly model. We're going to talk about the ritual characteristics of this heavenly model. We're going to talk about how heaven is glorious in its beauty. And because of that, so should our wor worship on earth be glorious in its beauty. We're going to talk about the place. And I have a little show and tell here for you. Uh, of worship, the tabernacle or the temple, and it should be beautiful. And as you see, we, we've already alluded to the heaven on earth. And finally, we're going to talk about what the structure should look like. The structure of worship, not exclusively the tabernacle or the temple, okay? So, as I emailed you, now it's up to you. Because from this point forward, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to give you a brief 10-minute overview, and then hit me with your questions. So I hope you read the first chapter. What, do you, what are your questions? Start with Isaiah. Okay, Sue. Oh, sorry. If, no, that's fine. Nobody else has something I can start. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and I, I don't have the Wi-Fi connection because I'm using a, a Kindle for my, my yeah. book. But, uh, so I don't have it in front of me, but you speak about a question right from the top of the chapter. Okay. There's a question. But you say the question, but you don't say what the question is specifically. <coughs> I was wondering if the question is, is there a biblical precedent for the construction of a church building? or for the church worship? Is that the question? At the very top of your... See, I can't, I can't help you because I don't have... Okay, I'm looking at the chapter right now. It's on page 11 at the top. Page 11, okay. Uh, but the question the, he asked was for those... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Okay. If so, did you notice the reverence and awe? The question he asked was, is there a biblical precedent for the construction of a church building? Or for the church worship? Did you notice the immediate difference in your reaction to being inside? Is that the question you're referring to? Yeah, that's it. All right, all right. I was confused on that. Yeah, the emotional reaction. While we're still on that paragraph, I have one little uh, question. On sure, that's what right. What's uh, referred to by the pre-1970 Anglican Church? The pre-1970 Anglican Church, before but they started... It, what's well, different than we have? Oh, uh, that was when churches actually looked like churches. When you would have uh, a, a dark narthex, when you would have stained glass windows, when you would have uh, choirs and hymn music, and you didn't have guitars and they didn't strip everything down and people weren't uh, presenting uh, clowns uh, to present worship uh, or having little skits 
as worship services where it was what we do today. That would be considered a pre-1970. Don't forget the big screen with the bouncing ball. Or the, yes, uh, follow Mitch Miller, yeah. It's uh, Agnes's daughter. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I can tell you my experience of, to answer that question was uh, a young woman, 19, 20 years old, who was raised in the Baptist faith, and all the churches had wood paneling, and there was nothing. Right. You know, it looked like a house with a problem. And I went to a Catholic school and walked into a stone church with stained glass windows. And for the first time, I smelled the incense. And I saw the cross with the body of Christ on it. Yep. And it brought me to my knees. Yeah. 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 And that's, I'm glad, you, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the crucifix because people get all. Uh, been out of shape uh, when they see a crucifix, uh, I, and I've heard and I've heard some ridiculous statements from people. Well, you know, they believe in a dead savior and blah blah blah. Any any depiction of the cross doesn't matter what it is. Any depiction of the cross, whether it's an empty cross or a cross with a crucifix, is an attempt to explain the passion of Christ. That's what it is. So if we're going to get nitpicky about it. Either, either iteration is incorrect because you can't, in one cross, encapsulate the entire passion of Christ because it includes his active and passive obedience, the life that he led. It includes his death and crucifixion, which is what the crucifix rep represents. And then it includes his resurrection and ascension, which is what an empty cross represents. So at that point, you pick your error. <laughs> That's ultimately what it is. But symbols are fine within worship. So at that point, it's a matter of what that particular church desires to communicate. That's all it is. Do you want to communicate the resurrection and the ascension? Then you go with an empty cross. Do you want to communicate the passion of Christ? Then you go with a crucifix. Very simple. Now, I want to read the first couple of verses in Isaiah because that's where we are. We're talking about Isaiah and Revelation. In Isaiah 6, verse 1, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple and above it stood seraphim each one with six wings two covered their face two covered the feet two with two he flew and one cried to another antiphonal singing antiphonal chanting holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth notice the whole earth is full of his glory and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke now I'm going to stop there before I get to Isaiah's reaction notice what's taking place the God of the universe in his house in, on his throne is being described by a human who is transported into the heavenly realm. And what does he see? He sees angels flying around, singing. Imagine the sound of antiphonal chanting, holy, back and forth. It's as if they're competing with one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And what does it say? His train filled the temple. Where's the temple? In the heaven of heavens. His train fills 
the universe. The presence of God fills every corner of the universe. And the smoke, right, fills the house. His presence, the smoke reminding us. Now we're in Isaiah, so it would be pointing back to the Shekinah glory and the smoke, the cloud that descends on the tabernacle and on the temple. And the very voice of God moves in animate objects. Wood starts to shake at his very voice. I emphasize that for this reason. We hear complaints all the time. The church is irrelevant. The church is boring. I can get more out of going, you know, wherever, to the park than on Sunday. I dare say, if we, in the church, taught that, that that's who our God is, it would be utterly impossible to say that church is irrelevant. And that's why I had JP and Sue read those two passages. Because Christianity, God's people, you guys are dying for lack of knowledge. And that's our fault. That's not your fault exclusively. You have responsibility to study, to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that needeth not be ashamed, but the burden of the responsibility falls on us to teach you, to train you, to encourage you, to uplift you, to show you who our God is, so that when you talk to people, and they say, eh, church is irrelevant, you turn around and you can say, then you don't know who God is. Because his very voice makes the earth tremble. His very presence, represented by smoke, fills the universe. His presence fills every corner of existence. And he demands things of you. And there are consequences if you don't meet those demands. And the only reason I can sit here and tell you this is because I put on Christ. That's the only difference between you and I, is what you should tell your friends that say church is irrelevant. You ever been in a church service where somebody has been preaching God's word and you feel as if somebody pulled a string on your back and you collapse right there in church and you don't know why? just experienced what Isaiah experienced. Because you've confronted and been confronted by the holy God of the universe. And you may not say it, but what you are feeling is what Isaiah expressed. Woe is me, for I am undone. And the Hebrew means disintegrated. I have been disassembled from my very core because I have met the God of the universe. Okay, so that's the first. How do you get, I mean, if, if you, you've never experienced that, is that because I don't feel, I don't, I don't have the spiritual knowledge, or is it because I don't believe enough, or? No, no, it, no, is it, no. I mean, how? Everybody in their everybody in their Christian life, everybody in their Christian life approaches their worship in the manner in which Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, is interacting with you. So you may not have experienced the same exact thing as somebody else, but I would dare say if you actually looked back at your 
experience as Lynn, and you looked and you simply said, oh yeah, there was a time when that actually struck me. You've had times when you were in, tr in church and something hit you, right? Oh, the first time I went to Faith. church after yeah. my third divorce, yeah. I walked in the door uh, in the narnex and I just felt like I was walking into the arms of God. And I mean, so? that, that was it. There you go. But the, it, the difference it, is that you didn't. You simply described it differently than I described it. That's all. Okay. Yeah, that's all. I'm just. I'm simply describing it the way something of that nature would affect me. Okay. That's. Yeah. But you've been affected. Anybody that has legitimate relationship with God in some way has been affected. Because if you haven't, then I would say we probably should have a conversation. It isn't the type of effect. That's not what I'm saying. You don't have to check off all the boxes that I, but you've been affected. Okay? Um, yeah, the, um, assault, the vanity, what we call the yeah, vanity, the vanity. Uh, let us worship and fall down. <laughs> we do fall down in the, uh, in the Anglican Church. It's yeah. on page 20 or whatever. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And fall down. No, you're right. No. And kneel before the Lord, John our Maker. Right? Yeah. We have that. <laughs> Every Sunday. Right Every Sunday. So, that's the first part. Now, let's. What are the What are the characteristics of this? What are the characteristics of the kingdom of heaven besides king, palace, temple, and the Holy Spirit descending? Yeah, Russ, what's that? Okay, you're talking about the. the um, the train fills mm -hmm. the whole universe, the smoke fills the whole universe. Is heaven the the temple all is all of heaven the temple and or is there you know talk about heaven is in many rooms, is in different places. I mean how does that all if it fills everything but you're in a separate room? I don't know, maybe I'm getting sorry. No, no, that's a that's a perfectly good question. All of this. All of this is to be a place of worship of the triune God of the universe, right? Okay. So when we talk about all of this in that context, then we are talking about all of this, all of the universe being created as an extension of the temple of God. Okay? So you're, what you're looking at right now, what you're trying to what you're trying to unpack in your mind is, are we talking about two different places? Are we talking about Kingsport and then the church? Right? Okay. You know, Kingsport being the universe and then the church being the temple. When scripture looks at what Kingsport would be and says, because we are worshiping God, that is a type of temple. But there is a specific place where we do express formal worship. Now, if you'll remember in the book, I made it clear that what takes place here and is transpired, uh, it's transferred down to here, cannot be exact, right? Because this is perfect and this is not. So where this and the universe can be that temple that we talked about, this can't. Because you cannot transfer that perfect okay. representation. So, in heaven, to clarify that, all of this is considered the temple. But on earth, we have to have a specific place because of sin and because of the limits of our humanity. You have to have a place to go. Yeah, well. the, this might be a good time to interject. With, on 12 and 13, you have um, symbolism of the temple being non-physical, and then shortly after that, the Lord Jesus is the true tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of fit that into yeah. what you just said? Yeah. Um, and while we're talking about that, let's do our little show and tell. Um, if you flip the plastic, you get a chance to see the Holy of Holies. And if you want to just look, this is what an artist's depiction 
that the temple would look like, the tabernacle would look like, based upon scriptural. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to step out of camera. Um, the all of that, all of what we see in Scripture, right? Whether we're talking about no, don't, 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 don't. Oh, you're looking at you're okay. That's fine. Yeah, you got the good one. That's the one over there that people are going to get tripped up. Just look at that one page. Otherwise, you're going to spend all your time. No, no, no. That book that I, oh, it's okay. open in front of Laurel. Yeah. Otherwise, what's going to wind up happening is you're going to look at that, and because it's so engaging, you're going to want to look through the whole book. So, <laughs> but so just look at. I promise I will bring it every week, and we can look at different parts. But anyway, to answer your question, Laurel, everything that Scripture describes to us, right? Um, all of the elements: incense, trains, thrones, candlesticks, robes, ministers. All of that points to the tr uh, all of that in the temple points to the true temple, right? Christ. It doesn't mean, however, because it points to Christ that we ignore it. Simply because Christ has come, it doesn't mean that all of those symbols get tossed in the trash. Yeah, because uh, the temple veil is torn in two when Christ. Uh, Gave up the ghost, right? When he on the cross. Yes. Right. So, and for that and other reasons, I think people in some folks in the Protestant traditions or streams think that it doesn't matter where you worship or what the place looks like, mean, because the dwelling of Christ is now with men. Right, and we'll get to and we'll get to the reason why that's incorrect right. in later chapters. Okay. okay. But right. we will actually address that. That, and that's why I. That's why I emphasized at the beginning, we have to stop thinking like Americans, <laughs> okay? Because it, that's the place, what Sue just pointed out, that's the, that's the crux of the problem that we have within Christianity, and that's what we're going to discuss. That's what the book is about. It's about how we're supposed to worship God, and are there instructions? Do we have information that tells us this is what the church is supposed to look like this is what worship is supposed to look like this is what it, this is what we're supposed to be doing this is what church government is supposed to be. are there instructions and yes there are and i will get to that but i'm not going to tell you today so well, what occurs to me is that we have handicapped ourselves spiritually the created the creator has chosen to have his That's a great way to put it. That really is a great way to put it. Um, that is a that's a that's um, a very colloquial way of speaking of Romans chapter one. And, and we meet colloquial. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, really we do. I mean, it helps us, right? Yeah. I mean, and we're talking here about collective worship. Yeah, yes, and I'll get to that. In the next chapter, in the next chapter, <laughs> yeah, I, I do, I, I do address. The, the, you guys are. This is good. You guys are thinking. You're, you're moving ahead. That's excellent. I just, I want to do this piecemeal, because, no, I, I mean that because each chapter builds on the previous chapter. So if we get this down today, it's going to be much easier next week when we talk about actual worship in the church and what that's starting to look like. And then that will set the stage for our definition of worship in chapter 3, and which is where we'll get to what Sue just pointed out, that there is a distinction between what we do here on Sundays and what you do at home. Both are worship, but there's an important distinction that has to be maintained. Okay? But that's a great, that's a great point, Diane, that you know, we've we've turned we have turned what God has given us and instructed us to do for Him, to Him, worship Him on Sundays. We've turned it into simply a sanctified version of a secular entertainment event. 
um, which gets into the very first point. Our worship is to be holy, right? Yeah, Lynn. So I, I have personally been blessed with being able to go into a Roman Catholic church in a huge city. And I can honestly say that it takes your breath away mm -hmm. because that they are so unholy. <laughs> I mean, they, they are, you walk in and you're just overcome with all of the opulence and the structure and everything. Mm -hmm. So does that make our little church here that we no. worship in? No. I mean, it's not built to the description of God's explicit revelation, but... That's a good... That, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's what... That, that reaction that you had is what I was fishing for on page, on page 11 when I mentioned what R.C. said, how many people have walked into a, a Roman or an Eastern Orthodox church. And the reaction you described is the reaction that he was trying to elicit from the audience. The audience. From, yeah, from his listeners. That's what he was trying to get at. When you walk into that place, because they assiduously tried to duplicate to the best of their ability what worship in heaven is like, it has an existential force. It affects you. It does. I mean, I don't buy feng shui, but if I were to be Chinese, I would say that's feng shui. Yeah. And I think when we get the amendments made to the altar area and to the rest of the church, it's going to... Uh, bring forth and, and that gets to the second point that I was going to make, and that is the point is not that church A is gorgeous and church B is a dump. That's not, that's not the point. The point is church A has the finances, it has the resources, and it has the ability to do what they do to create what they've created. What's important is what Roz talked about and what is now taking place here, and that is the desire to create God's house. That's the important thing. And you do it, you do it with the intention of ministering to not only the congregation, but to ministering to God. Remember. Worship is not us sitting in the pew being entertained. Worth, worship is worth-ship, ascribing worth to God, and that's something that we do. That I think I mentioned it in chapter 1. I, I think I did. I think I mentioned Kierkegaard's Yes. Uh, yeah. Do you remember seeing that? Yeah, here it is. Okay. Everybody know who Soren Kierkegaard? Sort of. What okay. Page Danish. He was a, he was a yeah, Danish philosopher. Uh, he was a Lutheran Danish philosopher theologian. Um, he was an existentialist. Uh, he was. Uh, it's on page uh, twenty-one. Um, he was. They call him the melancholy Dane, because he always seemed to be. He always seemed to be depressed. <laughs> And he probably was because he saw what was taking place in Danish Lutheranism, and it was killing him. It was so objective, it was so external that they were going through the motions, and then he would see them in the, I don't want to get off on Kierkegaard, but that he would see them in the public sphere, the same people on Sunday, and they were going to brothels, and they were getting drunk, and they were doing gambling, and doing all this stuff, and it was, it was really affecting him. And he made the statement, many Christians think that in Sunday worship, the minister or the singers are the performers. The congregation is the audience, and God is the director. But the reality is God is the audience, and we are the players, and the minister is the director. So when we come to church, our attitude should be one of focus on him. And I have to, and I will, I will ask you to pray 
for my forgiveness when I say this. Because it drives me absolutely insane when I hear people walk out of church and say, I didn't get anything out of that. Then you weren't there to worship. Uh, I'm sorry. If that is your attitude, that you walk out of God's house on the day that God prescribed that you be there to worship Him, and you're telling me that you didn't get anything out of that, then you didn't go in there to worship God. You went in there to be entertained. You went in there to be educated. You, whatever. But you didn't go in there to worship God. That's Mar one thing that bothers me. Because it's so hard to keep that focus when we have so much going on. That's one of the reasons I don't like Forgive me for saying this. What we're doing down here with the food and everything. Because half the time, I have to interrupt my worship to run down here and check and see if my food's burning. Well, you know what? Come back. Well, that, that's, that's, a legitimate, that's a legitimate point. That might be something that we need to talk about. And, and you know, that, how do we achieve that concentration? Well, I can't, I, I can't impose upon you... Um, a three-point plan <laughs> that's going to tell you this. If you do these three things, then it's going to resolve all your problems. I can simply make a recommendation, and the first recommendation that I would be that I would make is probably delay what we do. To, I, and this is not my parish, so I don't have the right to make unilateral decisions. But I would delay the beginning of cooking things down here until after the service. That's what I would do. If it's if it's a distraction, then that's what I would do. And I would like to say, move to the front of the church and sit in the first pew. But really, the fragrance is just so great. Sometimes you can't escape. <laughs> we got some good cooks here, <laughs> you know, and you just can't get around it. So that would be the one thing I would say. Uh, maybe we maybe if we talk to Father Yoshi, maybe we can figure out figure out a way to, to kind of adjust that. I did see your hand, Lynn. I'll get to you in a minute. Yeah, I uh, so, uh, the other thing that I would, that I would say is this. Um, when you come in to worship, do you, and this is, uh, and I'll just throw this out, not for you specifically, but just in general. Do you have um, an idea of praying certain elements of the prayer book to f begin to focus on the worship before, even if you don't come to morning prayer, which you better start coming to morning prayer. Um, but, <laughs> but if you come in and you sit down at 11, do you have in your mind this thought, okay, I'm walking into God's house, I'm now going to begin to worship God. How can I prepare my heart to worship God? We have great stuff in the prayer book. We've got, now, if you are interested, if you've ever seen me, and I hope you're not looking at me, but if you have ever seen me, you will see that before the service begins, I usually am praying, and I pull out a 5 by 8 card. I have specific prayers of preparation that I say from that card. And if you're interested, I can show you what those are. I can email that to you. Um, before I receive communion, I have prayers of preparation. After I receive communion, I have prayers of, of reception. Now, the point of those are, is very simple. It's to keep my focus where it should be. Because I am, as you are, I'm a reprobate. <laughs> and if you give me 30 seconds of my own time, I'm going to think about the football game, the hockey game, going to lunch, petting the dogs, taking the dogs out for a while. I'm going to think of something. I'm going to think of something. So God has been gracious enough to us to give us prayers that if we utilize them, helps us focus on him. Lynn? Um, I just wanted to, to say that at our mission meeting on Sunday, 
it was brought up that we delay eating until after we have our meetings, our mission meeting and our um, special. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, but, but that being said, if it's my understanding, we have really gotten away from what was originally intended, and that was just four finger foods. Mm -hmm. And now we have whole meals. And and so if we have blue finger food, you know, chips and dips, you know, you, you're not going to smell that. Can I make it? Can, can I make an observation? This yeah. is just an observation. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. In every church I have ever been associated with, mm -hmm. except for this one. Oh. Okay. <laughs> In every church I have ever been associated with, the after-service fellowship has revolved around coffee, donuts, and bagels. <laughs> That's it. This place puts out a five-course meal. It does. It's great. I love it. So if we change it a little bit, Maybe, maybe, you know, bring a couple of, I mean, if we don't, if we got, if we bring bang, bagels or croissants, you know, we could be a little French, <laughs> you know, we can, we can do some, we can, we can change it a little bit, but that's, that's on you guys, that's the mission committee, Roz is going, don't you dare change my meals, I like my food. No, 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 no that's not what she's saying. Like. Right, okay, that's fine. No, what I'm would be concerned about is I feel like that's something that we as a church can offer to people who come and I do think it has been I agree very, uh, yeah it's, it's a tough call um, if you get food, yeah. that's one way, way to get them sit You're and right. actually eat with each other and have a conversation and talk yeah. so at our yeah. former parish our priest stated that because he fasts until after the Eucharist yeah we had we, at our former parish. We also had a full meal that was a potluck. I'm uh, as so, I said. I, I'm not sitting here. I'm, I'm not criticizing the fact that we have. I lot, understand. No, I, I know lot, what you're saying. But the, I don't yeah. want it to become a distraction I, from my work. I agree. I understand. I understand. I understand. I understand. Right. And speaking yes. to that, when we go upstairs, this and this. Oh, don't even get me started like on that. Down here, because this and this. Yeah. Because you're going, well, what was that? Don't even get me started on they that. Need to be like, the other thing is, is that we handicap ourselves culturally, emotionally up there. Because there have been times that I would have sat there and just boo-hooed my heart out. But I didn't do that because that's going to disturb you all. And you're going, what's wrong with you? And there's nothing wrong with me. It's my reaction to what's going on. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, mm -hmm. The the idea that we do what we do here as an outreach is in, it, it's just so valid. Uh, it, that is that's incredibly true. Where visitors will stay, they they will if there's excuse me real food, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, and donuts and bagels, but real food, they'll, they'll stay, and that's a great outreach. It really is. It's a good ministry. Um, and for those that actually do contribute and, and supply some of this, that's a blessing. I mean, that really is what you're doing. Um, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not sitting here saying it's got to be an either or, or we have to completely turn everything upside down. All I'm saying is, as a church, we have enough brain power, we can probably figure out a way to do what we do and not make it impact what we do upstairs. But it's just going to take sitting down and spitballing. And there's a, an option. No pun intended, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to have coffee, donuts, and bagels between the end of morning prayer and the beginning of Christian education. Well, um... It's just an option. Well, we're, that's actually probably yeah, going to change. For those who, who but don't that, fast. Well, yeah, that's actually going to change, so I'm not sure how that's going to work. 
the, we're looking at change, flipping Christian education and morning prayer because we want people, we really, really want people to experience and participate in morning prayer and apparently 915 can be a bit onerous, especially for people that live that, that live up in the mountains or they, they have to make a drive. It doesn't seem anybody has a problem getting here at 10. So we're gonna flip, we're, we're, Father Yoshi and I have talked about flipping um, morning prayers so that it's gonna begin after Christian education. So Christian education will begin earlier and then this will afford everybody the opportunity Notice I said everybody the opportunity to be here at 10. Yeah, don't put your fingers in your ears. I'm so, I, I got my monkey contingent over there, yeah. I know who that monkey is. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that, that's, the, that's the goal. Because, look, morning prayer is an integral part of what it is for Anglican worship. Historically, that's what we did. We had morning prayer, then there was a change of vestments, and then, boom, we had the Eucharist. That it was it was a joint. It was two means of worship, but it was joint. It was connected. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't. I'm not going to editorialize it any more than that. I'll just say that. Yeah, Carol. Uh, to get back to this, Good. Uh, I would like you to expound upon on page 19 the connection between um, ritual and ceremony, and also. Uh, elaborate on tabernacle and temple. Okay. Um, ritual and ceremony are essentially uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, a ritual is, I have to remember how I. Um, the specific acts and elements there you go. perform. Yeah, there you go. That's ritual. Okay. So. Ceremony is the is the broad is the broad structure, right? So when we come to our service on Sunday, we are participating in ceremony. The ceremony of worshiping God. The ritual involves the specific things that we do. The priest is doing the consecration, we sing the hymns, we kneel, we stand, we pray. We, those are, that's the ritual in which we perform, but the ceremony is the the involvement in all of that, okay? Does that make sense? It does. Okay, yeah. that's the two it's, elements. It's just full. It's full. Yes, that's that's a good way of looking at it. Now, tabernacle and temple is essentially the uh, historical development of the same thing. Um, I'm, no, I'm going to leave this, but I'm going to show you something that you actually have in front of you, but I'm going to show you here. Um, all right, let's say we're talking about that's the, that's the tabernacle, right? That's the external structure. The skin's around. Right. And here, Here's the Holy of Holies. Okay? Here. Notice the difference in shape, and there is a reason for this. Here's the holy place. Right? And within the holy place, okay, here's the veil. Right? Anybody remember what's on the veil when the, when the high priest walks in and he's about to enter the Holy of Holies? What's the first thing he sees? He sees the cherubim with the swords keeping you out. Okay. Here's the Ark of the Covenant, and then we have um, we have all of the elements: the uh, altar of incense, the table of showbread. Uh, and my Jewish friends are going to kill me, but here's the menorah. Yeah. Um, okay. And then outside in the outer court, we have the laver, and then we have the bronze altar, right? This is a perfect cube. Okay? This is 
the less perfect cube. And then we have all of this. All right, so what does that tell you about what's going on here? Now remember, this is the east, that's the eastern gate. There's only one way to approach God, right? No other way, you can't get there any other way. So you have to come in here. And then how do you approach God? You have to approach God via a sacrifice, right? And then what has to happen? And it has to be cleansing, right? And then you participate in ministry because the ministry of the Holy Spirit, represented by the light of the menorah. And then you're fed. The table of showbread. The body and blood of Christ, right? And then you're confronted with both the anticipation of the presence of God in the altar of incense as your prayers are lifted up to the heavenly throne right here. So you're moving from less perfect to more perfect to perfection. And this eventually becomes the temple when Israel takes the land. David wanted to build the temple, but he was not allowed. Solomon builds the temple. And do you remember what happens in, I believe it's 1 Chronicles 7, when the temple is completed? Yes, the glory of God comes down. And there. what happens to And a big smoke comes in there, and they can't, all of them get driven out of, they can't do anything. You know what we often forget? What happened when God descended on the tabernacle? Yeah. The exact same yeah. thing. Yeah. Moses had to run out of the tabernacle when the presence of God descended on the tabernacle. When God's presence is recognized it is an emotional experience one of these days I'll sit down and I'll go through some of the references of people that have actually encountered yes. Yahweh in scripture and you'll see the reaction of these people and there are a lot of them and how they reacted to the presence of God but the tabernacle becomes the predecessor for the temple that's, it's essentially just a, a, a transition from being nomads to being residents. Okay. A question about the east door. I, I thought our churches were supposed to face east, but if you enter from the east, you're headed west. Mm hmm So, but the church is not, in that depiction, the church is not facing east, is it? Nope. You want to know why? I do. Okay. In the ancient Near East, in the ancient Near East, especially for the Jews, the entrance to the tabernacle was important, not the orientation of the Ark of the Covenant. After the resurrection, it became the focal point of the orientation of our church, our churches, and therefore we face east, the rising of the sun. Okay. Okay? Thank you. And that's really all that that's about. The key element <clears throat> is that there's only one way to approach God. That's the key element. Which is why <coughs> in many in many older churches there was only one door to the sanctuary. You can enter the narthex through front side doors, but when you were coming into the sanctuary, there was only one way to come into the sanctuary. And of course, once the building of churches became utilitarian, then, you know, the utility and functionality took place, took precedence, and all symbolic meaning went out the window. 
So, so our worship and the worship here is to be holy. It's also to be loving. Think about the seraphim, right? Holy, holy, holy. They are just adoring their God. They are loving the God of the universe. Right? Supposed to be willing. Yes, JP. Where do the masses worship corporately in this situation? What do you mean? Where does the nation of Israel worship? No, in your, your diagram here. Yeah. They're out there in the 40 years. Uh, surely they worship God with some regularity, but it doesn't look like there's room for them all in there. Well, uh, you're right. They were not allowed in there. <laughs> not even the. They you know, the part. They would went. They, they the most they would be in here. The outer court. That was all. But if you'll remember in numbers, we actually talked about this earlier. And remember in numbers, tribes. And this is not how they were configured. So don't charge me with heresy. But tribes were set up this way, right? They were de dedicated exclusively to Yahweh. Okay? So what happens? Daily. And these people had a long way to go. They were bringing their sacrifices, right? Whatever they financially able to bring. Pigeon, dove, goat, lamb, oxen, or bull. Have you ever actually read? I'm, I just, just curious. I'm just throwing this out as a question. Have you ever actually read the um, description of what the sacrifice? The sacrificial system was doing in one day. Um, yeah. I don't understand it's in the how book. they got the sweet smell of the incense to overcome no, the no. overpowering smell of burnt flesh. It had a problem. A lot of incense. <laughs> uh, well, you have to remember when we're talking about the sweet smell of incense we're not exclusively focusing on this wonderful fragrance that all of the Jews smelled. It was what God determined was the sweet savor. And when he smelled the incense, he considered that because those incense would metaphorically, or actually sacramentally, would carry our prayers up to heaven. And that was sweet our devotion and worship and praying to him being communicated to him via the incense that was being burned. So that's why we're talking about the sweet savor of the incense. It's not the Jews, they had to live with it. <laughs> and that's another thing to keep in mind when you start thinking about our sin. That's what they had to live with. That's what they had to see. And I actually include the description in the book, but it's later on. So if you yeah. want to cheat and look ahead and see. And because I, I actually I actually give you the numbers as to what was taking place. Were the women allowed in that area where the sacrifices were taken at, or do they just get to come in at the end and clean it up? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, That's a mess. Somebody's got No, the women did not clean it up. Were they allowed uh, to worship? Uh, in that area? Or they were just in the outer They were in the outer court. court. That was as far as they could. Yeah. They, and generally speaking, they, they usually did not go any further than, yeah. okay. than the altar of sacrifice, and they would be there. They would be accompanied with their husband if they were married. Yeah. 
Um, but no, the women that was <laughs> that was rec that was restricted mm -hmm. to the the three the three families of Levites, the Kohathites, the Gershonites, and the Miraris. Okay, mm -hmm. those were the three families that were involved directly with the ministry of the tabernacle. One group was responsible for the external portion of the tabernacle. Another group was uh, uh, responsible for uh, the holy of holies, and then responsible for the, all of the elements in the holy holy place. So. Because I've heard in the Orthodox Church <coughs> No, when you talk, you talk about Orthodox Judaism? N no. Okay. Uh, oh, you talk Greek Orthodox? Greek, yeah. Okay. I, I've, I've heard that uh, of course women are not allowed at all on the altar, but particularly right. behind the iconostasis, behind the, behind the roof, mm -hmm. they yeah. only come in once a year. Once, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's where much I was different. going. Yeah. That's much, yeah, okay. no, no, once that did not take place with them. Okay. Um, On page 18, you talk about joyous worship. Yep. Because actually we should be made aware of our sins. And I think that's where we go wrong as a church because... Too often, sin is a preach because you've got to keep these people in the pew. And if you make them uncomfortable, they might not come back. Yeah. Their so. Is more important than their <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here, here, yeah, here's the thing. Here, yeah. here's, the, here's the thing. Let me, uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to give you a brief, a brief historical overview that has only it's tangentially related to what we're talking about. In the late uh, in the late um, 1900, uh, 1800s, going into the 20th century, from the 19th century to the 20th century, uh, Christianity went through a. Um, I guess the best way to describe it would be an internal battle. A lot of the a lot of the young men who were going into ministry, Presbyterian, uh, Congregational, Anglican, were going over to Europe to do their doctoral work. When they went to Europe to study, what wound up happening was they were coming under the influence of neo orthodoxy, German higher criti criticism, uh, and it was creating uh, conflict. It was creating a uh, a lack of trust in the authority of scripture. In the early 1910s, between 1911 and 1913 specifically, an Old Testament scholar in the um, Presbyterian Church of North America called, named Charles Briggs was brought up on heresy charges because he denied the historicity of the Garden of Eden. He denied the historicity of Adam and Eve. I don't know how, but he was acquitted. That caused a split in the Northern Presbyterian Church. And in 1929, my alma mater was created, Westminster Seminary, to maintain the orthodoxy that was being advocated by Old Princeton. So what happens? Now we have this influence of higher criticism where people are casting aspersions and rejecting the authority of scripture. So what, so what the ministers stopped doing was preaching sin. When you don't preach sin, what's the point of salvation? If I'm not dead in my trespasses and sins, why do I need a savior? Uh, I don't. I don't care. I don't. So, okay. Some so, some poor Jewish guy got murdered by the Romans. Too bad. So sad. How does that bother me? Doesn't affect me. Two thousand years later. And from that point forward, people stop going to church. Right? What happens when people stop going to church? Let's just look at the unintended consequences. People stop going to church. They stop tithing. When you stop tithing. Churches can't support orphanages, hospitals, the poor, which all were, were created, not the poor were created, but the orphanages and the hospitals 
and the missions were created by the church to minister to society, to bring them to church, to hear about sin so that they would be saved. Well, now there's no point. Well, you don't have any money to do that. Churches can't support that anymore. But you got to do something, right? So now they, now they start to go to the social gospel. And at that point, the state looks around and says, oh my gosh, we have this problem. We've got all of these people that are homeless, that can't eat, that need to be cared for, and since you guys aren't doing it anymore, we're taking over. And we are now seeing today, over 200 years <laughs> of the result of giving up the authority of Scripture. And that's why you heard me talk about sin and holiness and God's holiness. It's not because I want to browbeat you. It's not because I want to make you feel miserable. It's quite the contrary. I want you to feel excited and I want you to be joyful. Why? Because even though you are reprobate and damned to hell before a holy God, Christ is your redeemer. And you wear his righteousness. That's what Corinthians tells us. He who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we could be the righteousness of God. And if that doesn't make you joyous, if that doesn't bring you to tears of happiness, it doesn't mean that every now and then we're so sit there and go, man, I really suck. <laughs> and that's when we fall at the foot of the cross and we thank our Savior for wrapping his arms around us so that we can stand before a holy God. And as Hebrews tells us what? boldly approach the throne of grace. Do you realize what he, the author of Hebrews is telling us? That in Christ, in Christ, you are moving from here to here. In Christ. You are doing something the high priest could only do once a year at the risk of his very life. They used to have bells attached to the tassels of the high priest's garments and a rope tied around his ankles. Because if he did not adequately confess his own sin before presenting the sacrifice for the nation of Israel on Yom Kippur. If he was not cleansed, he was dead. He was dead. God would execute him summarily on the spot. Do we understand now God's holiness and why it is so important that we have Well, sin isn't gone, folks. <laughs> if you're like me, the minute you open your eyes, you've sinned. <laughs> because what does Scripture tell us? We're supposed to love the Lord our God with what? All of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our mind, all the time. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year for rest of our lives and the first time the first time you let up that much God has the right to kill you on the spot he has that right but because of Christ he doesn't because you bear the right
righteousness of Christ. That, I mean, I'm sorry. I could, if I were physically capable, I'd do a cartwheel right now. I mean, you, is there anything that can make you happier than that? This is what Calvin said. It's, if, if we don't understand who we are, we'll never understand who God is. We give ourselves a pass. Do we not? We don't sit there and look at ourselves honestly in the mirror. But God does. So we sit there, you know what? God's not going to bother with that. That's just a little, it's just a little picky bill. That's all. You know, so I stole a paper clip from work. That's no big deal. Be ye perfect as my Father who is in heaven is perfect. And that was said by Jesus. So clap, sing, shout, jump for joy that you are in Christ's arms. But for those that are not, there is nothing, nothing to brag about. You see, you're forcing me to preach now, and I don't want to preach. <laughs> um, so we got joyous. You skipped down. We've already talked about perfect, so that's good. And notice all of what's taking place here with all of the elements. And if you've seen that, the tabernacle, did everybody get a chance to look at that tabernacle? How beautiful, how impressive that is? Our worship should mirror that. The worship here, that should be done here. It's congregational, right? All of the heavenly host, all of the heavenly host, worshiping before the throne. Reverent. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts as they bow before him. Remember the, remember the seraphim? They had six wings. By the way, you ever think about what angels in Scripture actually look like? You really want to see one of those cats? No, probably not. Especially when you talk about Ezekiel and John. Four eyes, eight wings, faces like lions, bears, and oh my. It's like, I, <laughs> no thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you stay there, I'll stay here, I'll be fine. Uh, but, what? Two wings, they covered their feet. They covered their feet. In humility. Sorry, I'm falling at the mouth. They, co <laughs> they covered their feet. With two wings, they covered their eyes. And then the other two, they hovered above the throne. We're going to have music. Well, we have ritual, right? Heavenly worship is ritual. We have incense, we have a throne in this glorious divine universal temple. We have ministers who have robes, right? Music, the angelic host singing their lungs out if they have lungs. And it's supposed to be beautiful. This is what God brings here to us. And as we go along, we'll unpack this a little bit more and more and more, but keep this in mind now. Just for your own edification at this second, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later. But this takes place, this comes down here, right? And then all of this is taking place as we move forward. Right? Throughout history, we have, we have worship. We come before our God. The Holy Spirit is involved in every step of the way. Every step of the well, way. We hope he's involved every step of the way. Unless we're being disobedient. But if we're being obedient, he's involved in every step of the way, right? And then what happens at the second coming? We go right back to doing this here in perfection. So let me ask you a question. If it's 
from here to here, and then all the way here, and then we're back to here at the end. Where in the where in the world, where in the world does somebody get the idea that says, okay, yeah, all of this happened, and then at the the ascension, it all stops. And then in the New Testament church age, we do whatever we want, however we want, until the second coming, when all of a sudden, we're right back to the earth. That's dispensationalism. Hmm. Amongst others. This is why understanding this and keeping this in mind is so important. And as I said, we will unpack this more and more as we go forward. Yes, Carol. So when we die, do we see all this glory right away, or do we not see it until the second coming? Um, you you wondering where we go after we're dead? Yeah. What did Jesus tell the thief on the cross? Uh, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What did Paul say in Philippians when he was talking to the Philippians? Uh, ditto. <laughs> that would be the Greek, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it is better for you, right? The albatross. That I be here with you. Oh. But for me, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. Now, is it the full consummation of our participation in heaven? No. Not. not yet. No. Think of it in these terms. And this just came to me, so don't 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 hurt me when I say this, but this just came to me. We have two options here. One is you die without Christ. Think about that in terms of going to a holding cell. Your Honor can tell us about that, right? You're convicted, you're done, you're going to jail, now you're just being waited, now you're just waiting to be transported to prison. Just as bad, just a different location, right? On the other hand, you ever take an international flight? You ever go to the international lounge with all the amenities and all the great little things? No? Uh, <laughs> you, we always close coach. Okay. Well, think of it. Think of it in these terms. On the one hand, you go to jail, waiting for prison. On the other hand, you go to the Biltmore, and you're waiting for heaven. Right. So you experience joy, but you don't experience the fullness of being in the heavenly glory until okay. consummation. Yeah. Now, um, it's 20 after. You want to stop? Because I'm actually just about finished. If you have any more questions, we can go until 1230. Otherwise, I think we did a good job covering Chapter 1. What was the thing before Biltmore? Bil oh, Biltmore and then heaven. Yeah. Nothing before, I mean, here. <laughs> Living in a shack, driving a pickup truck. This is, uh, this is probably one... This is the commandment to keep holy to have Sabbath has never been eradicated. Right. But we worship on Sunday, not the Sabbath. Yeah. How does that? Um, semantics. No, no. There, uh, there's a. I mean, that's the whole issue with Seventh Day Adventists. Um, you have to keep in mind that Sabbath simply means seven. That's that's all it means. All right. Now let's let's follow the logic and say, okay, we're supposed to we're supposed to identify that word as being Saturday, right? I thought the seventh day, but yeah. well, that's Saturday. Yeah. Okay. All right. So God creates the universe in six days, and on Saturdays He rests. On Saturday, he rested. What's the problem with that? Well, if you look at if you look at Genesis, talking about the first six days, 
it specifically lists chronological elements of the first six days. On the seventh day, it says God simply rested. The seventh day is designated as a day of rest. So the principle is that one in seven, one in seven is designated, it is set aside to honor, worship God. It is consecrated for God. Now, let's extend it, let's extend that. What happens at the end of six years in the nation of Israel? There's a Sabbath year. And so does God stop working in the seventh year? What happens at the end of seven Sabbaths? There's the year of Jubilee, right? So it's a principle of one in seven. So what happens with the early church? Uh, bless you. Um, again, as I mentioned in the book, we're switching, and I get to, I think I get to this in chapter three or four. We're switching from a mosaic understanding of all of these elements to a Christological understanding of all of these elements. So what does Acts tell us? And then on the first day, the church met to worship God. It wasn't as if they completely discarded the principle of picking a day to worship God, that wasn't what happened. It simply changed from the Mosaic day to the Christologic day. Now, if you're interested, next week I will bring a book in that goes into this. It's called From, Lord, From Sabbath to Lord's Day. I have to warn you, <laughs> if you want to get it, it's about 550 pages. <laughs> it's got about... 20 different authors talking about various subjects, but it is an outstanding it's an outstanding treatment and it's not it, it's not over your, it's not over, it won't be over your head so um, I'll bring it in next week, you can take a look at it also, also I don't um, he was a professor at my alma mater this is a phenomenal book um, for our purposes, I would just I would, I would concentrate on the first, do, 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 first four chapters, five chapters, six. Um, there's like 20 chapters in the book, 17 chapters in the book. If you stick to about the first third of the book, it, it does a great job of explaining this. And if you're interested in, um, I'll show you again. The uh, Vern, uh, Dr. Poitras, See, Dr. Poitras was a, uh, he was a mathematician, and he went to, uh, he went to Cambridge to do his PhD in mathematics. <laughs> I, have a, I have a friend that actually uh, went to Cambridge to sit in on one of the classes, and he said, um, when, when Vern graduated from Cambridge, they refused to give him his PhD. They gave him a Master of Literature. And my friend basically said, well, the reason they did that is because they didn't understand half of what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Vern is brilliant. He, he is brilliant. He is just a, he's a brilliant, brilliant man. Um, but he's a Presbyterian, so you've got to keep that in mind. But anyway, this is a great book. It does a great job of uh, connecting... Um, uh, the pictures in, in the Old Testament, the Mosaic pictures, uh, with the New Testament and, and Christ. And one last thing. Exodus, the, very, the first verse at the beginning of the chapter, at the very top of the page. Exodus 25, 40, right? You see it? It's right at the beginning of, of the book, oh. of my book. If you look at the top of the page, you'll see, right? Exodus 25, 40. I see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain, right? Pattern. You know what that word means? It, it's the Hebrew word, tabnit. doesn't matter that you know that. But it means shape, model, 
copy reproduction. Moses enters the throne room of God, which is where he was, at the top of Mount Sinai, the mobile throne room. The presence of God is there, and Moses is looking at worship in the heavenlies and has no point of reference and no understanding as to how to describe it. And Yahweh says, okay, dullard, write this down. And when you read Exodus and you read the law, what you are reading isn't Moses giving you his understanding of what he saw. What you are reading is Moses, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, using Moses' words, but through inspiration, you're reading Moses' transcription of God's explanation as to what he is seeing and being told, copy, reproduce everything you see here, here. If this is supposed to be a reproduction of this, wouldn't it be incumbent upon us to make sure we stay as close to this as we can, unless there's a reason not to? I'll leave that up to you. Well, sadly, my aha moment, well, you know, we talk about Jesus, our great high priest, and you go to Hebrews 8, verse 2, where he's actually conducting worship. Yep. And it's like, oh, I don't know why it was never connected to me. Oh, and by the way, um, since you mentioned Hebrews, the same concept is mentioned in Hebrews. Yeah. So this is not... The concept of pattern is not foreign to the New Testament. Um, we can continue, or we can talk at lunch, but it's up to you. You tell me. You wanna wanna stop now and eat? I'm getting the. I'm gonna cut your head off in a minute if you don't shut up. Okay, we good? Okay. All right. Next week. Next week, we will be talking about. The structure, let's see, what, how did I define it? From kingdom of heaven to kingdom of earth. So we're actually going to start unpacking this next week. So make sure you read, review, look at your notes for chapter 2.